you know, outside of, um, outside of all of the wonderful things that happened, one of the things that Pastor Dustin didn't mention is that he didn't just go down there with those high school students by himself. Um, there were people, some of you who took time off from work, uh, used some of your vacation time to go down and to be a part of that life change that happens. Because how many of you know that it takes people? It takes people. And so thank you to those that, that served and that took out of your time, those that are going to be serving this week in VBS. Man, they could be doing other things, going home and, I don't know, watching Netflix all night. Um, you know, I, I don't know. You know, but we're, we're, we have busy lives, and, and, but they're stepping up because they realize that it matters. Amen? Amen. It matters. It matters. It matters. Um, next uh, two weeks, the first week in, uh, first Sunday in June, we're going to be launching again our Discover... Did I say July? Is it June? It's been a, it's been a rough week, guys. <laughs> really. Uh, no, first Sunday in July. Thank you. We're going to be uh, launching our, our Discover class again. If you want to figure out, man, how do I connect here? What is this church about? What do they believe? Um, that is the place that you want to be. And uh, so registrations are open for that. I want to invite you. You can either just mention it to the folks at the Connect desk or you can fill out the Connect card in front. Um, it's a tremendous time together for three weeks, uh, getting to hear the ins and outs and then also discovering how God has uniquely wired you uh, and, um, and then how we can plug in to make a difference in our city. Amen? Amen. Um, for those of you that don't know me um, very well, I'm going to give you just a few minutes and kind of share my story. Um, we're starting a series. I call it a mini-series because it's two weeks. Uh, it's simply titled, Is It Worth It? And uh, just so you guys can know a little bit about me, um, when I was just uh, barely 10, I was just about 11 years old, when my family uh, packed up from Brooklyn, New York, and moved us down here to the sunny state of Florida. Um, and so 1978, uh, we made the trek down. It was after the great blackout of 77 in New York City. Uh, we survived Son of Sam. And, and uh, I, I think my parents made the decision the day that I came home from school and had learned some new words that were not supposed to be in the dictionary and uh, decided that New York City was probably not the best place to raise a young family. So we moved here in 78. And... And uh, as you know, grew up in church my whole life. Um, I, I, I went through middle school, uh, worst three years of my life, I think. Uh, the struggle was real for those three years. New to the area, new to the state, new to the culture, um, and then still trying to figure out like who I was becoming, right? Um, and then I got to high school and people figured out I could dance. And uh, that's, that's how I got my wife, for those of you that don't know. I was an incredible dancer. She immediately fell in love with me, and the rest is history. But, uh, but somewhere around my, my sophomore, my junior year, again, raised in church, kind of did the whole thing, Sunday school, VBS, kids choir, Royal Rangers, uh, you know, for those of you that know what that is. And um, something happened around my junior year of high school where I, I, I woke up one morning as the sun was shining through my window. It was a Saturday morning. And this thought just flooded my mind. And it was, the thought was this. If Jesus of Nazareth really rose from the dead, and if he really is a king, I think this guy deserves my undying attention and affection. And that was my salvation story. Shortly after that, um, I went to go get baptized in water. And it was one of the first times that I can say that I remembered actually hearing God speak. And um, as, I, as I went under the, the water and came back up, um, I heard this in my spirit almost... I, it, Again, not an audible voice, but it, was, it could have been. You know, it was so clear. And he said, son, I have a mission for you. And I remember, because remember, I was brought up in church my whole life. And so I got out of the water and I said, hmm, I wonder where that came from. Because God doesn't call people on missions. He calls them to the ministry, right? 
and it didn't make sense to me for a couple of years and until a few years later I was visiting a church out in Chiefland. I'll never forget it. The name of the church was the Lighthouse Word Church. They're still out there, Pastor George and Carol Tilson. And they had a guest speaker that was there, and me and a bunch of our high school friends, we charged out there, trekked out there to go to one of their meetings, and, and the guy was preaching, and, and he kept, he, he, he'd preach, and he'd kind of look at me a little bit, and then he'd keep going, and he'd preach, and then he'd look at me a little bit, and then, he'd, and then finally he said, you, and I thought he's talking to the guy behind me, so I'm like, he says, no, you. And he brings me up, and he puts his arm around, and we're walking through, and he says, many of you understand the concept of being called into the ministry. And he says, and, and, and because, you know, we, people sense that calling, and then he took me, and he pointed at me, and he says, but God has a mission for you. So that was the Holy Spirit that spoke so many years before. And, and I knew at a very, very young age that God had called me not just to the ministry, but to this city. Now, here's the rest of the story. Got married, got into the ministry, um, ended up writing checks that my character couldn't cash, got out of the ministry, left Gainesville, and had absolutely zero intention of ever coming back here. All right? I, I believed I'd used the term when you know what freezes over. But God had other plans. Because how many of you know that when God has a mission to perform, he doesn't necessarily consult you about how that's going to happen. And so we went through a period of time up in the Atlanta area, some of the best years of our lives, um, until the day I walked into the church and the, and the preacher decided he wanted to start preaching on Jonah. And God running away, Jonah running away from God. And so because the church where I was at is a very large ministry, um, I knew that they preached in series. I knew how long the series was going to be. So I said, I know what I'll do. I won't go back until the series is over. So I didn't go back for the rest of the series. The next spring, I came down to Gainesville to visit my parents. And I heard that the church had a sister church, Anthem, right down the street. So I said, I'm going to go visit the sister church. And I knew the pastor that was there, um, knew him back when he was a youth pastor. And so we walked in. I'm expecting to hear a good word. And what I heard was a recorded message. <laughs> Y'all know where this is going. It was week two of the Jonah message. You can't make this stuff up. And so we, the, the Great Recession started happening. And I knew at that time that God was saying, I'm sending you back to Gainesville. And I said, thank you, but I'm not going. Just being real, I said, I'm not going. And so everything in my business, I had taken a struggling business from almost closing its doors to being one of the top offices in the, in the company. First name basis with the president of the company, the whole deal, life is great. Suddenly, everything starts to dry up. I'm telling you, if you had put $100 in my hand, it would have spontaneously combusted. Business dried up. I said, so I know what I'll do. I'll commute from Atlanta to Gainesville, but I ain't moving back to Gainesville. Three days later, I got into a freak car accident. I still to this day don't understand how it happened because the car that I hit had zero damage. My car was totaled. And now we are a one car family. And now I have no choice but to come back to Gainesville. All the while not being sure, and I joke about it now, but I was deadly serious when it happened. I, didn't, I wasn't sure whether God was bringing me back to heal me or to kill me in front of my friends. That's how it felt. That's how it felt. I, this was a place that represented failure. This was a city that had represented immense disappointment. Um, and, and I hated this city. But God sent me back here, and for the next four years, I spent the next four years angry, just angry, avoiding everyone, avoiding everything. But during that time, God began to bring about a healing and a love for this city and a love 
for this community. And, because, and as I grew older, I began to realize that I wasn't the only one that God was calling on a mission, but that in fact, he's calling all of us to his mission. Amen? Amen. Jesus' final instructions to his disciples are pretty clear. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Let me, let me say that to you again. I'm going to say it in uh, this is Sean T. translation. Go, and as you go, make apprentices, submerging them into and under the authority and the rule of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Anybody have any questions about the command? What is the command? go. However, what I've discovered is that the gravitational pull of the local church over time is not towards going. It's not towards outsiders. It's towards insiders. And as we grow and as the church matures, there's this increasing pressure that we have to keep insiders happy while still trying to reach the ones that are outside. And if it continues and without an intense intentionality, we will find ourselves at some point catering only to the convinced and then kind of offering halfway prayers for the ones that are still outside. You know, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rulers of the law, they had created systems over time that had benefited and catered to the already convinced but it left the poor, the downtrodden, the non- and this nondescript group of people that they just called sinners. Right? It wasn't really a clearly defined thing. They were just, everyone that didn't fit into those clear groups were just sinners. And they left them pretty much to fend for themselves. And how did they did this? How did they do this? They created traditions, they created rules, they created even laws and things like that. And, and that disadvantaged the poor and treated sinners with disdain. These leaders had active prayer lives. They were givers. They were the builders of the synagogues and the schools of those days. And and listen to this. And their agenda was to see the advancement of the kingdom of God. But while they were seeking to build the kingdom, they had lost the narrative. And this was the narrative. For God so loved the world. That began to elude them. So, and I have this statement. I'll have them put it up if they have it. Mission outside of the narrative of God's love for all of humanity will always lead to oppression. Some of the greatest battles that we're facing in the globe today are by groups of people who love God. But outside of the mission of God's love and the narrative of God's love for humanity, mission becomes oppression. Their their commitment to the mission of God without the love of God, notice I didn't say love for God, all right? They loved God, but they had forgotten about the love of God, and it drove them to do all kinds of things, including creating uneasy alliances with the Romans, secret agendas of their own and a host of systems and powers, of, uh, systems of control using scripture, tradition, even laws to accomplish their ends. Then Jesus shows up. And what does Jesus do? Jesus begins to create this crazy, weird coalition of followers. They're, 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 this, this, this diverse group of people, they're uneducated and they're educated. Nothing special kind of people, fishermen and tax collectors, revolutionaries and terrorists, women, some with culturally questionable backgrounds, and yes, even a few Pharisees. Jesus has this incredible ability to take those who were traditionally seen as outsiders and help them to feel like they were insiders and to help them feel like they belonged. Jesus presented to the world a God who loved the Samaritan and the Roman just as much as he loved the chosen ones or the Jews. Strangely enough, 
Jesus was able to do all of this without ever compromising truth. To the woman who was caught in adultery, he could, he could speak words that made her feel safe and made her feel uncondemned and unjudged, but yet he still would say to her, don't do that anymore. To people who were living in sin, he was able to talk to them and to tell them about their sin without them feeling isolated and judged and alone. And at the end of the day, all of the insiders, they hated him. Because it's almost like he invited people into a club that they weren't supposed to be in. And for all of his work, they crucified him, hung him on a cross to die. And so my question is this, as I was meditating through all of this, when did we start making a distinction between who's in and who's out? When did we start believing and acting that somehow we were a different class of people than the, those people? Is this something I want us to ponder this morning? How did Jesus view those that we called outsiders? And more importantly, how does he view them today in the 21st century? You know, religion creates a world where there are insiders and outsiders. If you believe like I do, if you vote like I do, if you kind of have the same worldview that I have, then man, you're welcome to come in. But if you don't, now we don't say this out loud, right? Because this is crazy talk. But let's take a look at our actions. At best, what we do is we view them with suspicion. And it challenges you know, even how we want to communicate if we know that they're in the room. But how did Jesus see them? And it's very simple. He loved them. He really loved them. He never saw people who we look at as outside and saw them as a project. He saw all of them. He saw the foreigners. He saw the sinners. He saw those who were that we would look at and say, eh, not really worth our time. You know, John was one of the youngest um, of the apostles. He was, in fact, the youngest of the 12. And um, he writes about a, a, a scenario that happens. Jesus has risen from the dead. They've already seen him alive once. This is the second time that, uh, I believe it's the second time that they're seeing Jesus again. They're all out fishing and they can't catch anything that whole night. And Jesus goes back to them and he says, hey, throw it out on the other side of the boat. And so they do it. They catch all of these fish. And then they realize, man, that's the Lord. And so Peter, as he always does, impulsive Peter, Peter doesn't waste time getting in a boat and rowing back to shore. He just <laughs> dives in and he heads over there and they're all having breakfast on the Sea of Tiberias, on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. And, and so this story picks up in John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. If you've got your Bibles or you're online or you're taking notes. Um, and Jesus has, as part of the, the meal, he begins to have this conversation with Peter, of all people. Now, you got to understand, for those of you that don't know the story, of the 12, Peter was the one who had, like, boasted, man, I'll never betray you. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll die for you. And then in less than 24 hours, Peter is like, I don't know that dude. I, don't, I ain't never seen that blanking, blanking dude, man. I ain't got nothing to do with him. And so he is, I mean, he's just completely turned his back on, on Jesus. But how many of you know that Jesus never turned his back on Peter? And he said to him later on, he says, tell the disciples and tell Peter to come on. And he's reinstating Peter um, along with the 12. And he says this beginning in verse 15. He says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed 
my sheep. Now here's the thing. How you view this passage will have a direct effect on how you view your relationship to the church and to the people outside the church that you and I are called to love and to serve. Because if you believe, like I did for a long time, that the sheep that Jesus was talking about were the Christians and the church people, and you take a look at Peter's life, you immediately run into a problem. What do I mean? If what they were referring to is that, after, is that Peter, I need you to take care of all of the church people and all of the Christians, what Peter should have done after Pentecost is he should have sat down and began to pastor and shepherd the flock, what we traditionally call the flock or the church. But what do we see? In Acts chapter 3, we see preach, Peter preaching to the crowds in the streets. We see him healing people in the streets. We see him getting arrested and beaten because he was going out into the streets to preach the gospel. He was visiting the Roman centurion outside of the church in the, in the Roman centurion's house. All of Peter's activities seem to be taking place outside of the fellowship of believers until you get to Acts chapter 5. It's the one time you see Peter inside the church, and when he shows up inside the church, people just start dying, literally. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, for those of you that, that don't know. So I'm, I'm sure when, when Peter came to church, people got nervous, all right? And then, in fact, in Acts chapter 6... Something begins to happen. Some of the needs in the church aren't being met. Now, if there was ever a time for Peter to obey the command to feed the sheep, it's Acts chapter 6, because the needs aren't being met. And do you know what they said? It's not right for us to wait on tables. Oh, wait, 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 Peter. That's like literally what Jesus said. Feed the sheep. And what does Peter do? He hands it over to faithful men. And he, and, he, and he says this. In fact, let's go there. It's Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will, return, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So either Peter has completely misunderstood Jesus' command or he simply ignored it. Or he knew exactly what Jesus was telling him to do. And nothing was going to dissuade him from that task. And so what you see in that passage is you see an expansion of the small group ministry. You see the birth of the deacon ministry, right, that's happening in there. And I'm going to say something and hear me and hear with the heart that it's intended because it's going to come across a little offensive probably, but love me anyways. Why did they hand that over to other people? They did it because of this. It is not the job of the pastors and the leaders of the church to spend their energies making sure that everyone inside the church is happy. I know that's like modern church thing. It's like, that's why we hired you. That's why we pay you to make sure that our needs are met. But Jesus tells a different story. The disciples understood a very different thing. Let me be clear. Anytime you have questions, what is the church? What do the pastors do? It's threefold. Number one, Go, make disciples, and that means to reach out to those who are currently not disciples. Number two, to teach them to obey everything that Jesus said. That's the job. And then the third thing, because Paul drills down, Paul says, listen, Jesus gave you apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip the saints. Are there any saints in here today? <laughs> to equip the saints for works of service. 
This is why some of you are taking time off from work and taking time away from your family this week to come and serve in our VBS this week. We're calling this week Reach Week because all week we're going to be reaching to children all throughout our community. But, uh, and, and then there's still some others of you, 12 to 15 or 20 of you, that this Wednesday are going to converge on this location at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to help feed hundreds of people in our community because you are the ones that are doing the work of service. You are the ones that are letting your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. So Jesus says to these, to, to, to Peter, he says, listen, I need you to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Here's the question for us that we need to answer because if we're gonna understand that passage, we need to answer this question. Who are his sheep? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36. He says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, somebody say that, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on them because he saw them as already belonging to him. They were his sheep, whether they were in the fold or outside the fold. They were his sheep, and he loves his sheep. And I want to ask you, do you love your city? Do you love your community? Because here's the reality. You will never reach a people you do not love. And the reason is simple. Because it's hard. It's hard. It's difficult. It's so much more easy just to gather in a circle and pray for them and hope for the best than it is to actually engage. And if the element of love does not exist, we're not even at the right starting point, church. And let me, let me say this again. Jesus saw them as sheep, not as people who would be turned into sheep. For we are his sheep, the people of his pasture. So how do we view those that are outside our walls who don't share our views maybe don't share our politics, maybe doesn't share our, our, our ideologies. Let me tell you a little bit about the community that you live in. Alachua County, it's a population of about 258,000 people. Out of that, out of that 258,000, only 42% of them are, have any involvement with church. 53.53% of our community are what has been termed the nuns. In other words, they have no religious affiliation. They're home right now, sleeping in or they're on a lake somewhere. They're doing whatever. They're not going to watch us online. They're not going to tune into us or to anyone. And in case you think they're godless, only 3% of them are atheists. Let me break that off to you in numbers. That is 148,000 residents in our county that Jesus says, those are my sheep, and they're lost. How we view them when we begin to realize that they're not a project to be one. Jesus sees them as sheep. Listen to Matthew 18. Verses 12 through 14, he says this. What do you think? If a man owns a 100 sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on a hill and go look for that one that's wandered off? And if he finds it, I truly tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 who did not wander off. In the same way. So just like that, Your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Who's dispensable? 
I mean, we say that because that's the right answer, right? But by our actions and by the ways that we live and the ways that we do, I know that I'm guilty. I'll walk by people. And, and, and let me pause right there because now um, everybody's now thinking about the guy on the side of the street holding a sign. I'm talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about your coworker. I'm talking about that family member, right? Because it's real easy when we talk about stuff like this to go to like the real extremes, right? And now we want to try to figure out because we don't know those people, right? We can do whatever and then we might not ever see them again. I'm talking about the people that you will see when you're walking down the aisle in Publix or Aldi's. I guess that's the new, hot, the new hotness, right? Um, you know, what do you, what do you see? When you see them, do you see sinners, lost people to be avoided, or do you see his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, that God is absolutely 150% committed to finding them and leading them home? And so I want to leave you just with these three things. The question is, is it worth it? What is it worth? to see his sheep come home. Number one, you can write this down. It's worth examining our priorities. Jesus did not ignore those who were in the fold, because I know a lot of times when these kind of messages come up, inevitably the question for us goes, well, what about us? Man, we're still called to disciple and to build up and to, to raise up within the church, and that's why we have our small group ministry. In fact, we're getting ready to, uh, some of you are gonna get a phone call from me um, or an email from me this week because we need a host of people that says, I will make the sacrifice, I will take the next step to help lead and to help disciple and to help to tend the flock who's here. So be praying. You're either praying, God, send me, or you're praying, God, please don't let them send me an email. But then next month, we're going to go through an extensive month of just training and just understanding what does that mean so that you go in equipped, because remember, that's our job, to equip you for works of service. So be looking out for that. It's very, very important. Um, but ask ourselves this question. Are we, are we prioritizing go into all the world, or are we prioritizing feed me, feed me, feed me? Let's examine our priorities. Are we prioritizing, um, uh, I just said, what, are, are we prioritizing making disciples? And by disciples, here's what I mean. Those who are currently not disciples. Tomorrow we've got a whole bunch of folks descending on this place that are stepping into that go. Thank you for stepping into the go. Thank you for coming out on Wednesday and stepping into the go um, and uh, to reach that. And so I, I thank God for that. Here's the second thing. So we wanna examine our priorities. I think it's also worth sacrificing our preferences. That's a big one. I've been in church a long time. When I came to Jesus, things were done a certain way and they have incredible meaning to me. Right? Um, you know, there, there are songs that we sing and, and, and ways that we do things that aren't my personal preference. So you know what I do during the week? I play all the stuff I like. <laughs> I listen to all the preachers I like to listen to because I know that when I get here, it's not about me. It's about those who still haven't seen, who still haven't heard, who still don't know. Jesus said this in, in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 39. I love this verse. It says, no one after drinking old wine wants the new. For they say the old is better. So can I get this out of the way? I've said this a lot and I'll say it again. Can we all just agree that the way that God used to move in church was better? Can we just, uh, can we just all agree the old songs are better? Can we all just agree it was better? All right. There's no argument there. Jesus said it. No one wants the new wine if they've tasted the old, because the old was better the way we used to do it. Man, I, I'll sit, I've been, like I said, I've been in church long enough, so I can sit with like even people that are older than me, and, and we can remember, rem reminisce about these songs and about these things that we used to do, and man, weren't those great days. 
It was better. But Jesus is only offering new wine. And so are we willing to sacrifice our preferences? What happened with the Pharisees, you need to understand, Pharisees is not code in the Bible for bad people. They loved God. They had created the things that they created so that they would not even come close to transgressing the law of God. So they built other laws so that if they broke it here, they were still safe here. But unwittingly, it became a barrier to another generation. It became a barrier to another people hearing and receiving what God had for them. Let's not repeat those mistakes, church. Amen? Amen. Last thing, it's worth giving our lives. We all know that Jesus died for the lost. But you know he wasn't the only one. The disciples also gave their lives. Everyone but John, and it wasn't for a lack of trying because they boiled that brother in oil. He just wouldn't die. So they stuck him on an island somewhere. And there were many after them. If you guys really want a good read to really depress you and really excite you all at the same time, it's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it just lists those who have given their lives for the name of Jesus. Going back to Polycarp, who was the disciple of John going forward through just name after name after name after name after name of people who understood the assignment and understood that God's love for the sheep mattered more than their own lives, that this message of reconciliation has to go out. And if it means that I got to be arrested, if it means that I got to be boiled in oil, if it means that I got to be shot through with arrows, it is worth it. So here's the good news, folks. We don't live in a country where that's really a thing. You know, you want to know the biggest thing you're going to have to deal with? Somebody doesn't like you anymore. I'll let that sink in for a little while. It's interesting that we're okay offending people because of our way of life. We're, we're okay with offending people because of our politics. We're okay with offending people. Well, that's just the way it is. But when it comes to the love of Jesus, man, we suddenly, we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. They're worth it. They're worth giving up our pride. They're worth giving up our future even. And what do I mean by that? As a corporate church, as an organization, what's most important to us? Perpetuity? or fulfilling the purposes of God in our generation. I've said this with our leaders. You may or may not have noticed this, but every single church listed in your Bible, every single one, no longer exists. There's no church at Ephesus. There's no church at Thessalonica. There's no church at uh, Philippi, church at Corinth. They're all gone. And let me tell you why I believe that is. Because what mattered to them was not how long they survive. What mattered to them was fulfilling God's purpose in their generation. Church, we have a community, we have a county, we have a city and surrounding areas that need to hear the love of Jesus. They need to hear the word of God. They need to know that God is not against them, but that God is for them. They need to know that no matter what they've done or or even what they believe, that God is calling to them. And you and I have to be that mouthpiece. What's it worth? It's worth everything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I was like, oh, I want to believe that. But what does that mean about my favorite pet program? What does that mean about my favorite ministry? It means that as a church, we are going to do everything within our power, short of sin, to reach the sheep that he loves. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. This is, uh, I like to say, this is like one of those no fanfare, no must, no fuss kind of moments. 
But if you're here this morning and you, you're, you were hearing us kind of talk through this and you go, hey, I think he was talking about me. I think he was talking about me. I'm one of the 53% that I don't, I'm here because somebody promised me a chicken dinner when it was over. You know, I'm, I'm here because they bribed me with something to get me here. Um, and if that's you, we're having this conversation this morning because we want you to desperately know just how much God loves you. Sometimes we as a church haven't always behaved that way. But look past us. He's still working on us too. Amen. Amen. He's still working on us too. But I want you to know that he loves you, that he's for you, that he gave his life for you, and there's a host of others that did the same. But his mattered. Because when he did it, he did it and took on every wrong thing you've ever done, every wrong thing you've ever said, every wrong thing you've ever thought. And because of it, the father looked at him and says, because of what you've done, I will stand with anyone who walks with you. And so I want to invite you this morning. We're going to do a quick prayer. We're going to go out of here and we're going to eat chicken dinners. And I don't know why I'm stuck on chicken today. I guess I'm going to have chicken. But the reality is, the reality is, is we're going to go here and for the next couple of days, many of us, we're going to go back to our lives. But you don't have to leave here the way that you came in. And so I just want to lead us in a prayer this morning. So every head bowed. And let's all pray this together. Um, and, and if this is you and you're praying this for the first time, it's simply asking the Lord to come and to be the Lord of your life. Let's pray that together. And just say these words with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for seeing me as your own. I realize that you have never hidden from me but that I have been hiding from you. And so this morning, I believe that you sent your son, that he died, and that he rose on the third day. And this morning, I confess with my mouth, Jesus, you are Lord. Father, I pray over these people this morning, Lord, for those that may be here that are praying that for the first time, Lord, that they would have an assurance and know, even as Paul said to us, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God has raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. And Lord, that they would, that they would accept that, that they would believe that, and that probably as importantly, that they would now move into a community of people who know and understand and, and are just a little farther down the road of faith than they are. And that they would grow and mature and understand that life with you really is better. Lord, I thank you for that. And I rejoice with those people here this morning in Jesus' name. And all people said, amen. 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 Yeah, let's go ahead and give the Lord praise this morning. Listen, thank you so much. For those of you that are visiting this morning, thank you for being with us and hanging with us. Man, I hope that in some way something has inspired you to want to know him better. You know, um, and uh, also remind you that we do have those connect cards. If you would mind just filling that out and dropping that with our um, team um, at the connect desk because they have a gift there for you. If you're one who prayed that prayer this morning and this was your first time or, or maybe you're coming back to faith, um, if you would do us a favor and fill out a card and just check, check on that box that says, I think it says, I became a follower of Jesus or I'm following Jesus for the first time because there's some things that we want to get into your hands immediately and as soon as we can to help you with your walk with Jesus. So this week, do me a favor. Go find somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Don't try to save them. This is an easy assignment. Listen to them this week. And just let them talk and hear their heart and then trust the Holy Spirit to give you a response. So go inspire somebody to follow Jesus this week and then bring them back with you next week and we'll see you again. God bless you.